So this uh, talk is about my the library that I created over the past year called Pattern. You can find it at uh, my GitHub Pangloss Pattern uh, domain. And yeah, let's get started. So who I am? Um, so I've been yeah, I've been programming for a long time. <laughs> You know, I had to uh, practically beg my parents to get me a Commodore 64 when I was about 10 years old. And after about a year of, of uh, working on them, I, they finally got me one. And, uh, you know, so you know, since then I've been doing startups. And, um, I've been, um, you know, lead developer for a bunch of startups, did a bunch of consulting, um, eventually started my own doing graph database stuff and data center management um, quite a while ago. And then in 2018, I, I co-founded Untether AI and we're making uh, computer chips. They do AI acceleration. And the whole thing is about making them super energy efficient and super high performance. It's really cool. And, but the talk's not about that. So I'll just mention it. Um, related to, you know, building computer chips, uh, compilers is a big topic, right? So getting code that runs on uh, your chip is important, making it as optimal as possible, making it as easy to, to um, uh, write code that runs on your chip as possible, it's all really important. So compilers like become a really big subject for me. So I've been really digging into that recently. Um, so that uh, gets me onto this library. So um, why did I build this library? So there are a few things that came together. Um, I, right before uh, SDF, Software Design for Flexibility came out, um, I just happened to have gotten very interested in the um, SICM utils library that that was uh, um, first done by, I think, uh, I can't remember his name. It's Little Red Computer on GitHub, I think it's Colin. And then Sam Ritchie sort of took it over. Um, and it was just sort of picking up, picking up steam and being really cool. And so I was super into that and kind of checked out the, the architecture of that and how the pattern matching works. And I, you know, did a couple of relatively minor kind of pull requests on that project just as I was getting into it. Um, but I really liked the design and it's very different from any other software projects I've seen before. And then this SDF book came out. And it basically describes how the th it describes the thinking behind that project, right? Because Sikkim Utils is is a port of Scheme Utils, and Scheme Utils is written by the guy uh, Jer uh, Jerry Sussman, who was a co-author on SDF. So really cool and just like perfect timing. So so that was one thing that really got me interested. And then the other thing is the NanoPass compiler, uh, which has sort of interested me on and off since I saw Andy Keep's talk at the Closure Con ages ago. And I actually spent a lot of time digging into that, right? So the NanoPass compiler is used in, uh, in this course, uh, Indiana University uh, course, which is available online called Essentials of Compilation which comes with a really nice little book that's written for the course. So I went through all of that. I went and reversed en reverse engineered um, Shiz schemes, uh, or like kind of tried to understand their compiler, ported, uh, eventually ported a few of their compiler passes to use pattern just to see if I could, and I could. Um, but yeah, so that's awesome, but it's like the biggest macro I've ever seen in my life. It's basically the whole compiler is seems to be one enormous macro and um, very complicated, but some just amazing ideas in there. So, so I basically wanted this SDFs like super flexible, extensible, like genius architecture with some of the ideas in NanoPass as well. So that's what I've been trying to build. 
Um, <clears throat> so pattern, there are three primary pieces in here. There's the matcher patterns themselves. Um, they're, you know, basically you find a, you define a pattern to, uh, to match against, and then you send data to it. And if it matches, it'll extract the pieces that you select out of it. And it'll tell you if it, if it matches. So even if you're not extracting from it, you can, you can know that something matches, um, and then doing substitutions, which is kind of the inverse of that, where you've got some data and you want to create a piece of data, sort of combine them together into something, in some structure. Um, and then rule combinators kind of combine pattern matching and substitutions. And you don't have to use substitutions in a rule, but usually, almost always you end up doing that, or at least I do. Um, so you're finding matching data and applying transformations. So I think people have seen these types of patterns before. Um, you know, so at the top, you've just got a, a regular S expression, but you can match against something like that. You know, you can match against literals. Um, you can stick a variable in so that question mark X in the second form there is, uh, is a variable. So whatever is in there, whether that's, uh, you know, a number or another arbitrarily large form that's in that slot in the list will get bound to X. Um, you know, you can have multiple variables, uh, uh, you, you know, the double question mark on, in the fourth spot there is match any number of, of forms. Uh, so it's zero or more. And so if you've got a list of anything with a one and then anything else, uh, this will match, assuming there's a star at the beginning. Um, it does unification. So the next one, uh, question mark X, where it appears twice, is only going to match if both forms are identical. So, and you get the sense. So there's a slightly more complex one below that comes from um, a little algebra thing that I did in my test suite just to try it out, sort of ported a bit of code from um, scheme, Sikkim utils. But the, you know, the beauty of these matcher patterns is the high signal to noise. You know, it looks like the data you want to match. Um, you know, many libraries can do what we're looking at here, but you know, how far can you take this? And the answer is you can take it quite far. So there are a lot of more types of patterns that you can do. And if you've got a system for extending and registering new patterns, then it's easy to just throw new ones in as you go. And you know, it's purely additive. Um, and you know, so I do that on a regular basis still. You know, so even after a year of um, building uh, software with with this library, I'm still. You know, I think the last time I added a new pattern type was a few days ago. I uh, I wanted to add exploded sort of maps, like key value argument pattern. So stuck that in as a supported uh, pattern. It's easy to do, so why not? Um, but So here's just a few, right? So the first one, just do a predicate. So we're matching X, um, but it only if it's an even number. Um, you can do, uh, uh, the next one is, um, the first argument is a literal, so we just match yes, it has to be the word yet, like the symbol um, yes. The next one can be anything as, it's, as long as it's not the symbol no. <laughs> um, now inside that not, you could also have another pattern. It doesn't have to be a literal. Uh, in fact, in pattern, literal itself is just another type of matcher. Um, and then there's a maybe, so this is zero or one. Uh, so that's the question mark, colon, question mark. And so, you know, we could have yes, anything, maybe, or yes, anything, and that's the end of the list. Both of those would match that. Um, you can do repeating patterns. So here, this is a bit more complicated, so I stuck a little example in. So here you could do an infix, you know, plus or star, 
add as many of them as you want, and it's going to match those because that's what the question mark colon star does. So, and the interesting thing is that there's not just one um, uh, matcher inside that repeat. So it's a it's a repeat of pairs in this case, but you can have as many elements in that repeating unit as you want. So it's it's kind of cool, very flexible. And the, and you see kind of what the match result looks. So it grabs everything that that matches to ops into a, a vector and everything that matches to y's into another vector. And then you can do also and or. So this would match this or that, and x would be would be bound to either this or that. Um, yeah, and there's you know there are 36 matcher types. I'm not going to go through them all here, but you know, if, if we have time at the end, I've got tons of sample code and we can play around in the REPL a bit and I have time to do that, so. So, um, substitution, it, you'll notice those patterns look very familiar. The substitution syntax is identical to the matcher syntax. And that's really, really useful. It means there's only one syntax to learn and substitution engine is powerful enough as well that all of the sort of other crazy matchers and stuff can be mapped to substitutions. One of the really cool uh, things that comes out of that is that I can, uh, there's a, some, there's a matcher type that I'll, I can get into a bit later that allows me to choose how, um, it descends into the subsequent into the nested data forms by annotating the pattern directly. Um, and so I can do rules which are just descent rules, which don't actually specify how the result needs to be formed. And in that case, I can just take the matcher pattern, use it again as a substitution pattern and just um, rebuild the same form with whatever parts of subforms have been transformed by recurring into the pattern matching system, um, you know, automatically. So it, it turns out to be very clean and nice. I don't have it in the slide, but I'll show that off later in the, in the, in the REPL. Uh, another really cool thing about the substitution system is that it fully pre-compiled. So um, it, in fact, the pre-compiled result is identical to what Clojure produces when you use a backtick form. So if you've ever used backtick, uh, double backtick, and it's exploded into this sort of large structure of literal calls to vector, list, concat, all this stuff, this produces the same structure uh, internally. And um, it, so it produces, I think, pretty efficient uh, code to put it in the substitutions, right? It's not having to go in and sort of interpret the, uh, the substitution pattern that's done at, at macro expansion time. Um, yeah, so that's substitution. Um, so then, so rules is kind of where everything comes together. And for me, it's the most important part. It's the part that I use all the time. Um, well, I use all of these pieces all that like fairly frequently. I definitely use substitutions on their own when I need it. And matchers on their own are sometimes great if I need to just see if some piece of data matches um, a pattern that I'm interested in, or if I wanna extract a bit of data out of something just to do something else. Really easy to use matchers, but rules are sort of a, the main event here, I think. And what they really uh, amount to is a pattern matcher tied to a function body. Um, the, yeah, it's a pattern matcher tied to a function body, but the arguments to that function body are just the, uh, the bound variables that are pulled out of the matcher. So um, if you look at this ID uh, rule here, a, it turns into an argument to the function body. So you can just return A just like that. So um, here we return zero. So none of these use substitution, but you can see how 
um, the, the result of these very simple rules um, can be defined, right? So here is an interesting one where now I could have done this with question mark A over question mark A, um, but I wouldn't be able to show what this uh, feature, how uh, another key feature of rules, which is if the body returns false or nil, it's as if the rule didn't, ma didn't match at all. So um, we'll get into com rule combinators and stuff later uh, where you have a lists of rules and you sort of go through and you search for the correct rule that you want to use. Um, so in this case, if A and B are equal, then we know that the result is one. And if not, we just don't change it. So it just uses the original value. So we return nil, it just goes back to the original unmodified value. Okay, so combining rules. So, you know, I think you guys all know, you know, I think it's pretty, a lot of people know cellular, cellular automata and stuff. And if you don't, you know, just watch anything that, you know, Wolfram Alpha, has tons of stuff about it and Stephen Wolfram's like super into this stuff. I find it interesting, but you know, the thing for me that's that that I that's so fascinating is how you have this very simple, very, very simple rules and they produce these amazing um uh you know unexpected behaviors, right? So combining rules is uh, a very, very powerful thing. And um so, so we have a bunch of different rule combinators, um, but they amount to three basic types. Right? So we can aggregate rules. So that's like just a rule list where you just search like one rule after the other and you look for a match. And once you found a matching rule, that's you're done with that, the rule list uh, for that pass. Or you can have, you know, rule, uh, in order where you just have, you know, you try each rule and if you do a transformation, then you carry on down the list using the result that is transformed. Otherwise you use the, you know, the unmodified result. So that's an, you know, those are both interesting um, strategies. They have applications. Then you have iteration strategies. So you might want to say, repeat this rule a number of times or repeat it until you hit a fixed point. Um, and then you have descent strategies where, uh, you know, you can do all sub expressions. So you could do a depth first uh, post walk traversal over all of your data where, you know, you go in all the way to the deepest and then you start applying rules and you transform. And then as you get up, as you go up the tree, the data inside your data forms now may be transformed from rules that have matched deeper into the tree really powerful for you know you know the the algebraic simplifiers in sicumutils uh, use that a lot um you know um yeah uh, another strategy would be pre-walk and so an example of pre-walk would be macro expansion so everybody you know uses macros and an or you know enclosure they expand into if statements um and you know you can have and and ors inside of each other. So you, you first you expand the outer one, and then you expand the inner ones, and you sort of recursively uh, go through. And sometimes a macro will return another macro. So you expand it, and then you try and expand it again, and you keep on expanding one form until it reaches a fixed point, and then you go do all of its uh, children, child forms, right? So that's. Uh, um, so that strategy can easily be expressed by rule combinator as well. And in fact, uh, for one of my compilers, I built a macro expander and works works fine. Um, and a really cool thing is that rule combinators are themselves rules. So I can have a rule list of a bunch of different rule lists, or you know, I can do a, a des like a, a descent through something or a simplify rule of, of a form. And then after that say, okay, and once I've finished simplify, then do this rule, then do that rule. And there's all sorts of combinations, right? So they can be combined anyway, because a rule combinator is a rule. So they're interchangeable with each other. 
it's, it's really cool. Okay, so that's kind of a high level what the library is. So now I'm just gonna kind of work through one example in slides. And then after we've done that, we can poke around on the REPL a little. So, uh, you know, in fixed math is kind of fun. It's, I think, an example that a lot of people when they first get into Lisp are kind of like, I wanna try this, like, I'm gonna do it. So I think it's easy to identify with, so a good example. So, so here are a couple of examples of the types of things we want our infix math gadget to do. So, you know, just evaluate the math, simple enough. Um, and then uh, also do some symbolic math. So, you know, we can see here that um, the constants get folded up. Otherwise, everything's kind of not too changed, but, you know, see the order of operations a bit more explicitly. This one is not obvious at first why it would re reduce to a constant, but remember that V over V is one and X times zero is zero. So we get rid of the, the, uh, uh, the variables and we can evaluate the whole expression. So let's look at how it's built. So we'll get into all of the components, but I'll just give you a high level overview of what we're doing here. Um, so we're gonna use a simplifier rule, which like I said, it goes down into the leaf nodes, um, you know, simplifies each leaf node. And when it's done, it moves up to the parent node and it, it, does, it does a post walk. Um, so we're gonna, do the, the operations have to happen in a specific order. So we match in order here. So we're gonna grab operator pre precedents, um, do um, expression order canonicalization. So basically that really amounts to um, uh, in, you know, constants go at the beginning, uh, variables next and expressions next. So you, you have uh, you just put put expressions in order. Um, and then we're just gonna do multiplication identities and evaluation, division, add and subtract. And then sometimes you'll have a, a group that's in parenthesis, but there's only one thing in it. So you just get rid of the parenthesis. So that's one sort of solo rule. So just sitting here at the bottom. Okay, so uh, I don't, I'm not looking at those in order. I'm kind of looking at them in, uh, in kind of, we'll look at the simplest ones first. So if we're dividing by zero, uh, we can't do anything with it. So we're just saying the result is the same. Um, I want this to match just so that we don't start trying to divide um, by zero and crash. <laughs> Um, and otherwise, I think these are familiar rules. We've seen some of this before. So here I've got the A slash A. Um, X and Y, you notice that here I say, oh, if it's X and Y, then just do the math. So how do I know that those are integers? <laughs> well, that is because I've got this with predicates thing in here, and we'll get into it later. But basically, there's a way of saying that if I bind a variable with a specific uh, name or name prefix, like I could say x or x0 or x star or y, in this case, I've created these, these predicates saying that they have to be constants. So they have to be actual, I think I, I, think I put number, they have to be a number. So, um, if both, the only way that this rule will match is if X and Y are both actually numbers. And so then I already know that I can evaluate it. So it seems a bit like magic here, but if you name your predicates a bit better, um, right, uh, then it's, uh, it, it, it's a bit more obvious and it makes, your, it makes uh, larger sort of libraries of matchers really nice and readable actually. So that's it for division. So multiply, 
Um, one thing I did in this thing, just for the heck of it, um, which makes things a bit more complicated, is I didn't um, pair up every expression. So I, I actually try and, uh, we'll see this a bit later, but, but basically, if I have uh, five multiplies in a row, you know, A times B times C times whatever, I don't put each of them in a separate parenthesized pair. I just put the whole string of them around with one parenthesis. Uh, and so, you know, because I was messing around with the rule system, right? It's not necessarily the most brilliant way to do it, but it's kind of fun. So that's how I did it. And so here I have to match, like, I have a first value and then any number of multiplies. So it's like X, which is, remember is a, a number and then times and, and then Y, which is also a number. And I have question colon plus means I match at least one of those kind of regex style. And so there could be any number of Y's, but there'll be at least one and there's only one X. So then that's perfect for using apply. So I can just apply multiply to X and all of the Y's. And then A, however many, there could be zero or more values here, which are, you know, some other operator than multiply is in there. And so I've got sort of a before and after sort of anything, but this is gonna capture greedy, greedy. So we'll capture it all. And we'll just do the multiply, stick the before and after back in, and it's done. Um, another pass I think we saw earlier were sorting forms. So I always know that the constant will be at the beginning, the number will be at the beginning. So I don't need to check for a and one as well as one times a. Uh, so yeah, so I can look for the identity and the zero and do those, add and subtract, kind of the same idea. Um, here, I just look for pairs. So I kind of did it in a simpler way, same with subtract. And it's gonna eventually, because we're doing a simplifier, it's gonna eventually get them all. And in fact, I've even got a simplifier in this form directly, which wouldn't really be necessary, but it's there. Uh, so the simplifier has a simplifier in it, but that's fine, that works. Um, and let's see here. Okay, so now here we're putting things in parentheses. Um, so we've got two, so we only really need to put division and multiplication in parentheses uh, to, to make everything work. And so we basically look for anywhere where we're dividing two things. And if, there is actually something before and after it, then we're gonna, you know, put the before and after in place, but put A and B in parentheses here. If there's nothing before or after it, then it's already in parentheses, so we don't need to worry. Um, and, uh, and then this is doing exactly, pretty much exactly the same thing for multiply. Um, yeah, again, this one is grabbing a whole chain of, of things to multiply and not, not pairing them up, right? So basically it's uh, um, matching, but it'll only match if A, uh, if the first, if the last uh, operator in A is not a multiply and the first operator in B is not a multiply. So, um, so that, uh, that does that. And then the order, I've, there's a little function that I think I borrowed out of Sikkim Utils that does expression ordering. So we won't get, we'll get into that. But basically um, we grab B and any commutative operator. So this is again, another predicate. So we grab any commutative operator and A. And if A is less than B, that means that they need to be reversed, and so we reverse them. So now we put A commutative operator B. Okay, so that's ordering. And now something that's straight out of the nanopass world, which I thought was an awesome idea, 
uh, is this predicate stuff, right? So um, typically this is done under the hood, but here I'm doing it um, using the sort of tools that are available to do it yourself. So I'm making uh, an abbreviator predicator. And so X is the abbreviation and anything that's X should be a number. Anything that's Y should be a number. Anything that's com should be either plus or star. So those are my, my two commutative operators that I care about. And yeah, so I just attach the predicate to those expressions. And you'll notice that I use sub in this macro. And so since there aren't questions, we'll have to, uh, uh, you can think about, we can answer after the, after the talk why, uh, why we should use sub here, or if we used backtick and uh, um, splicing to stick the rule in, how would the rest of the expression have to change? Okay, so, so just back to just sort of rehashing the rules here. So this is the expression now. So we're setting up our predicates. We're doing a simplifier on this list of rules and we're gonna do the operator precedence put things in order do multiplication division add and subtract subtraction and then uh clear out any unnecessary uh parentheses okay and that's uh again that's just another review that sort of allows us to do these types of expressions Okay, so does this actually work? Um, so I use this all like every day. I have written, I think I mentioned the current compiler I have has 40 ish passes in it. I've written, uh, I wrote a course for the IU. I wrote like all the exercises for the IU course uh, with separate whole set of passes. Um, you know, I wrote a Python to closure transpiling translator thing, um, which is kind of cool. And it's only like maybe 400, 500 lines of code. Um, you know, prototype compiler for our hardware. I'm currently working on a graph based uh, series of passes for that compiler, replacing sort of the main optimizing part of the compiler for now with a sea of nodes uh, style compiler, which is actually what the like um, hotspot JIT is built with. It's a really cool architecture. Um, some interesting papers on that all from the nineties, but super worth reading if people are interested in compilers. Um, yeah, and I wrote macros and utilities like you saw. So, so that's that. And, oh, what we didn't cover, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> that we didn't have time to cover here. Um, but, you know, there's this, uh, the most powerful rule combinator is the directed one. I'll show, I'll show it off a bit in the REPL. Um, there's this chain operator, which is also super powerful. And after I created it, I ended up creating uh, half of the matchers I create are just created with the chain matcher. So um, uh, there's a uh, sort of utilities for creating compiler dialects, which come out of the nanopass idea as well. And they're really cool because they give you the predicator things for free. Um, you can sort of specify on a rule set that they have a dialect coming in and then everything is predicated using that dialect and you produce a dialect and then you can use that for verifying the results and making sure that your output conforms. You can also conform your input as well. So that's been really useful for, you know, finding bugs, let's face it. Um, so uh, another thing is that any rule can have an environment um, uh, and you can, there's a way of returning or like modifying the environment, either descending into the data structure using a modified environment and then returning 
either a modified environment or putting the environment back. It allows you to do it, you know, things like evaluation. You could write an, an interpreter using this thing. In fact, and I do like, you know, part of when you're doing compilation, you need to know what variable scopes you're in and stuff is very similar to interpreting. So that's uh, that's all possible. And, you know, things that I just forgot about because I'm kind of maximalist when it comes to features. If I think of something, I try it out. Sometimes I forget about them. So that's the library again. Um, but maybe let's get to the REPL. And hopefully people have some questions. So, so there's a few things that are interesting to show off, I think. Um, uh, so I've just sort of grabbed a bunch of code here and we can see how um, we can do different substitutions and stuff. If we macro expand this, you can see how it that expression turns into this um, uh, this simple uh, you know the simple statement basically that creates an array or hash map and a vector for the last argument. Or um, right, so some of these they have this has an or statement. Um, should be in here somewhere. So that's an, an or there. Um, basically, but by, by having these things be expanded, um, like, you know, into literals, it means that there's virtually no runtime overhead to, to using this, right? So, and assembling complex data structures can be, um, you know, is a bit can be a bit of a pain. So it's pretty nice to basically be able to say, here's a template, stick data in here and there, and away you go. And so that's kind of what the substitution engine does for you, and you don't have to worry about overhead. And you can you know, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff here. So um, including uh, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, here I I have a it's one two three. And this is sort of in the category of features where it's like, should I have done that one? But there it is anyway. Um, so this is going to expand a set of um, A, and then this arrow thing means that it's actually going to apply whatever function you provided to A before you insert it. So you end up with, you know, A is one, for both cases here. So it should be one, one, two, two, three, three. But you can see it's one, two, two, three, three, four, because it's in, this is told it to increment that. This is occasionally useful, but I find I don't use some of these features too often. Um, let's take a look at, let's see. Oh, some interesting stuff in the algebra one. So here's a real algebra. Well, real. Uh, it's so. This is a few rules that I've kind of borrowed from Sikkim Utils and just poured it over just to see kind of how they how they would go. Um, so you know, these are more realistic numerical rules than what I um, what I was showing with the infix math. But if I run this, then I can I can show a few things. So if so if I, you know, do an expression like this, it simplifies. Um, and so here you can see that we've squared some, you know, we've done sort of distribution and all the stuff that, uh, that you might expect and it's probably correct. Um, here we're gonna get X to the fifth. Uh, yeah, so. Um, here are a couple of interesting functions that I um, that I did that uh, that just sort of generate big chunks of data. So like here is uh, symbolic factorial, <laughs> um, and so we can we can run that and see. Okay, I'll just evaluates to to a function, or we can do a symbolic Fibonacci. 
And if we do that, it's, um, it's, you know, and so if I, if I ret run this, I can actually look, and I did this the other day, I just extracted all of the X's and counted them and all the ones and counted them, you can ignore the zeros. And it does turn out that there's 55 ones, you can see here, 55 characters here and 88 X's. <laughs> so that was my <laughs> way of quickly checking that seems correct. So, um, you know, here's a version of where it, it, it's uh, just, it's, something else it's not quite factorial it's just a little bit more complex expression and it comes out to this sort of interesting um, uh, statement so kind of cool so but um if we look at these there's nothing in this that uh just get rid of the nesting not necessary there's nothing in here that we haven't seen right so we're matching um uh, numbers, we're not using the predicator stuff here. So if you don't do that predicator thing, then you end up having to say, you know, what your predicate is in place, which definitely makes it a bit noisier, right? So if, if I had the predicator thing, then I could just have this be N1 like this and this be, you know, N2. And, you know, as long as I know that N is always a number, then it's pretty safe. So. But um, this is, you know, sort of the alternative way to do that. And some of these, you know, this stuff is all just pulled from my test suite, and uh, um, you know, basically, I, you know, just grabbed it and thought, okay, I can poke at this. But some of this stuff was written before relevant, potentially relevant features were added to the library. Oops. So, um, oh. Here's an interesting one. So kind of always show calling a rule with just one function, right? So we have this rule combinator algebra two, and we call it like this with just the data. But you can also create a rule here. I created this rule. Um, it produces just a big map of all the things that we capture. And here I'm calling it with the data, a nil environment. But then uh, callback functions, continuation functions that are called if there's a match. And another one where, which is called at the end to say it's done and that produce, to produce the result if necessary. And so this is kind of cool because what I can do is capture a match. So I stick it into this atom RS here. And then I call try again. And so try again is just the, uh, the callback that internally is used if a rule fails. So if I run this, it ends up matching, um, capturing the result, failing, and then matching again. And because I'm capturing all the results, and in the end, I'm returning that result array, you can see the whole set of matches that the rule captured. And so you can, so you, you see this typical sort of search pattern here. Um, if we look at the rule, this is saying that V is a match of many, but it has to have exactly three elements. Uh, w is also a match of many, but when everything is matched, it needs to match this predicate, which is here. And it's basically saying, well, count is one. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of silly stuff that ends up in a test suite, but um, just different ways of doing things. So I can say, give me the whole match and does it match with you know the current set of matches? If it has one element in the you know captured, then this is going to match. The next one is predicated on being an int. And then the next ones are not predicated. So there has to be a C <laughs> here and then uh, any number of things. So, and so you see uh, Y capturing 
um, nothing and Z capturing everything at first, and then that fails. So it backtracks, Y captures one thing and Z captures two, and it backtracks until it runs out of possible backtracks. And then it just says it's done. It thinks there's no result, but there's a result because we've captured them. So that's kind of cool. Um, okay, I think that's it for the algebra one. Um, And I think there were a couple others here. There's tons of stuff in here, but um, yeah, actually, here's one where I was playing with um, uh, a set of rules, kind of silly, as tests tend to be. Um, so I'm calling this rule with uh, 100 as the start, and it's a list of rules to match, and we're iterating. So if if we match one, then we're gonna do two. If we match two, it's three. If we match nine, it's a fixed point because it returns nine. Uh, so that will cause the iteration to stop. Uh, three and four, you know, three produces four, four is also a fixed point. And then if it's anything else, it just tries again with X minus one. So if we run this, it produces nine. Um, and that's because we started at 100, we count down, and we hit 9 as our fixed point. Okay, so that's a rule list because it's going to basically find one rule, match it, and then try the iteration again from the top. An alternative strategy is to do rules in order. So here it's the same set of rules, but if we run it, it produces 3. And so why does it produce 3? Well, let's see. So we start at 100, we go down. First thing we're going to, you know, we're going to have, it's going to get to nine eventually, come down here and it's going to match nine and stay nine. But then it comes down here and finally it's going to match this and produce eight, <laughs> right? And so now it keeps on going and then it's going to produce four, match four, and then, uh, return three. So now it comes through as three, it turns to four, matches four, and returns three. Now it's reached another fixed point. So, and if these don't ever reach a fixed point, they'll just run forever. So you have to be a bit careful when you're doing iterated rules. Um, what else? Okay, so the last thing I'll show, and then I'll wrap up because I'm not sure if we're over time here. I can't remember what time we started. I don't have a timer here. Um, but I haven't heard any any yelps of pain. I, you got a few more minutes if you want. Okay, okay. Okay, so the last thing is the directive matcher. So this is the one that I mentioned in the slides. And so um, let's see what this one does to start with. So this one produces uh, two plus C and wraps that in plus 33. So how do we get there? <laughs> um, see if we can figure it out. Okay, so we're gonna go through this list of rules. Let me get rid of this nesting. Okay, so plus um, A and uh, B. Oh, yeah, so double question mark exclamation mark is the same as uh, uh, match many, but it's greedy. So it's explicitly greedy. And so um, so this will, will grab one and a list of two as the result. So it'll be one and then a list of two. Uh, and yes, so that will then insert C. So we'll say plus one and uh, C, and then two will be here. And, but we actually descend in here. This is maybe not the greatest example because it's a bit complicated. Let me see if I do in a different one. Uh, let's see. This is a bit 
Let's see here. I didn't really. Uh, ah, this is a much better one. So here, let's see here. We have several examples. So we have three rules, add one, two, three, down, add one, two, three, up, up. So we're, this is what we're doing. Down is saying, we're gonna match the command down and we're gonna descend into the, the uh, whatever's after it. So that means that we're going to recur into the list and start over from with whatever is in here. If we match up, we're not going to, we're just gonna return the literal. And if we match add, we're going to add up the whatever's in there. So when we call add one, two, three, it produces six. Down add one, two, three produces down six. Um, up add one, two, three leaves to add unmodified because we don't descend into the child form here. Um, down, down add will still do add the values up but having an up in here means that everything afterwards is just literal so it doesn't actually so it just produces the literal value here so yeah so that's that and this actually shows another thing the utility of having rules without an actual body right so so this down does transform the data but it transforms it by saying we know that for this form, we want to go in and transform the nested data. And this is such a useful feature. I use this. This is the matcher that I use the most. In fact, you know, some of the internal macros I use, I just by default wrap my rule, rules in uh, directed so that I can make use of this. Um, yeah. And so here we've got two rules without bodies. Um, and then one rule with the body. And, and this is also useful um, because it'll terminate a rule list. It matches, it successfully produces a result that's the same. And it just says, you know, based on having this up, I don't want any further rules to be checked. And uh, we, can, we can stop searching this rule list. Yeah, I think that's all. I think that, that's enough uh, sort of REPL demo. I could probably do this all day. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the chain as well. Do you have oh, an example? Yeah. Okay. yeah, let's see here. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. So, so uh, let's see if I can. Oh, man, I don't have many examples of chain here. Uh, Okay, well, this is, an, this is an interesting one. This shows off chain and another example called force. <laughs> and um, this is one that I could picture needing, but so far I don't think I've ever actually needed to use force. Um, force is kind of like, uh, I think of the CSS, like uh, force, like setting your CSS rules high priority or whatever. People here have done much CSS, but you can basically mess with things by just forcing values, and and uh, that's sort of what this is. So here I'm matching B A, and so X is B A, and then I'm reversing it. So what the chain does is it alternates between matchers and functions on the result of matching, and that's really cool because you can say. There's a data structure that I'm interested in. I want to match it. And then I know that I only care about some value in the data structure. So then I could, like, for instance, a uh, type of uh, a useful chain rule would be something like um, uh, I could say, like, um, if I had some sort of um, field like, uh, or say like person, like a person type is a typical kind of example. So I can just say, I have a predicate that says it's a person, like it's an, you know. Uh, and so something like that. So I've got 
X is a person. So then I could say, actually, I really just want their, um, uh, their address. And then maybe their address is a map. So then I could say, I could use the map matcher and say, you know, street, um, city. And so, so here I've got um, matching, right, with a predicate, a function, in this case, a keyword, you know, acts as a function. So it transforms the data, gets the address out of it. And now I'm saying, okay, well, if the address is a map, then I can extract street and city out of it. And my matcher will be X, uh, street and city, but maybe I don't want X. So I could just put underscore and underscore is the special don't care matcher. Right? So I could do that and you can keep on going, right? So I could, I, uh, the result of this would be, uh, what would that be? I'm not sure what data structure that would produce. I can't remember, but um, you know, if I just match, oh, you know what it would match, it would be the whole address map still. So um, I could I could then um, you know I could say uh, maybe country is a is a uh, data structure in itself, and I could I, I could have um, you know, capital, <laughs> right? So I could match again here, right? Or I could say here, I could say, I only am gonna match the person if they live in the capital city. So that's, that's kind of a cool example. So um, yeah, so that's the pattern and so you could, you can use it in a variety of ways, right? So I could say compile pattern and you need to put a, let's see here, restriction in is all to a function. Okay, well, let's just say everything with the person. Ah, uh, oh yeah, sometimes you need a back tick. The question mark on person. Uh, Person is a predicate, no? Oh, that's right. That's right. That's better. Okay. Thank you. And so now person could be could be mapped just as well. So I should be able to um, So I can say match person. Uh, let's see here, address, street, uh, city, um, Toronto. I'm in Toronto, uh, country, boundary line, capital, okay. so that should not match, but if I, that should match, there we go. So it's quite expressive, it's reasonably intuitive, um, but you can do a lot of powerful things with this. So I've built a whole series of graph database matchers on this, where, you know, instead of, uh, you know, map lookups, I've got graph traversals in here, because you can actually match sequences in here, like we happen to be matching maps, but, but uh, sequences would work just as well. Um, yeah, all, sort, all sorts of stuff. So this is a really cool pattern. And uh, if I change this to false. And actually I wouldn't have needed to change that. So maybe you can match again and it matches. So yeah. And of course uh, these are 
you know, in a way, some of these things remind me a lot of closure or spec, right? So these are open matches. So um, right. Um, so it's still gonna match, doesn't matter. So yeah. Okay. I think uh I think that's done. I see that there's a chat message. Let's see here. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah. So maybe let's go for Q and A.